I'm Harriet Vancefold, Clinician Scientist from McMaster University in Canada, and I'm so delighted to have with me Manish Patel, Professor of Medicine from Duke University. He's Principal Investigator of the Oceanic AF Trial, and we are here at ESC 2024 to discuss his hotline trial results. Welcome, Manish. Thanks for having me. Give us some background about your drug and the hypothesis that drove this trial. Yeah, so, you know, our patients with atrial fibrillation, despite these huge advances with DOACs still need better antithrombotic therapy. About a third of them, and depending where you are in the world, don't get a drug that they need, whether it's warfarin or a DOAC for anticoagulation. Better places with quality, maybe it's 80%, but there's still 20, 30, 40% people don't get it. They get underdosed or they bleed. And it's this fear of bleeding that might make people not take the therapy correctly. So on that background, we studied a, a molecule called asyndexin, which is a small uh, molecule orally taken that inhibits factor 11A. Now just a brief reminder, you know, we all were in medical school. The coagulation cascade always makes us a little bit concerned. The 10A inhibitors and the thrombin inhibitors are very direct at stopping clots. The, the factor 11 inhibition pathway is a pathway that's through contact inhibition that prevents the, the clot from growing, mm -hmm. not from forming, from growing, so thrombin propagation. So the idea was if you inhibited factor 11, you would stop clots from getting prop, pro, propagating, getting big, and leading to strokes, but you'd still have hemostasis less bleeding. Right. So the possibility of better efficacy and safety at the same time, which is sometimes very difficult to achieve. One could argue we've been chasing that for a long time and we'll still keep doing it. And most of the anticoagulants we have in practice have gotten better mm -hmm. by being better in the warfarin, by bleeding less mm -hmm. in the brain and other things and causing less stroke or at least similar rates of stroke. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, was the idea. So we randomized 14, 000, over 14,000 patients on the way to 18,000 patients with atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. a mean CHADS VASC of about 4.3 to see if we could reduce stroke or systemic embolism, at least be non-inferior to it, reduce mm -hmm. bleeding, and then have a win on net clinical benefit. Sure, so high-risk patients and a very clinically relevant primary endpoint. What established the dose of the drug? Yeah, big question, because when trials, as you know, and we'll talk about or stopped early, people want to understand, how did you get there? Mm -hmm. And is there other pathways? Mm -hmm. So we had used a program of information in addition to basic preclinical data. Mm -hmm. We'd actually use this therapeutic in a phase two study with atrial fibrillation called Pacific AF, where we had 20 milligrams and 50 milligrams used against apixaban. Now, one of the hard things in atrial fibrillation is knowing efficacy for stroke reduction. So mm -hmm. in that study, we saw bleeding reduction and no signal of stroke risk. Mm -hmm. And then the drug at different doses was also used in AMI and in stroke in secondary phase two studies. And in each of those, we got some sense of that. Mm -hmm. Finally, factor 11 activity or inhibition was measured. And at trough with 50 milligrams, 92% of the activity was inhibited, almost at the upper range of, the, of, this, of this assay. So those things led us to go to that dose. Right, and 92% seemed to be a reasonable level of inhibition. Tell us about your non-inferiority margin and how you established that. Yeah, it's a great statistical question and clinical question, sort of mixed together. Mm -hmm. So non-inferiority requires you to say, well, we're going to be as good as the predicate or the prior mm -hmm. therapy. And so the DOAC studies had used a non-inferiority margin around 1.37 or 1.4, saying if we're 40% range within that, recognizing if you're at the top end of that clinical decision going to have to be made, we're going to see we're non-inferior to warfarin. So using both a combined meta-analysis and statistical modeling and that predicate, mm -hmm. we used the margin. The idea of the margin was going to be on the 1.4 side or even... 137 to 14. Now, what happened was while we were enrolling the patients, and when we got to about 14,800 patients, um, the DMC contacted us and said, You have to stop the trial because asyndexin at this dose in this population is inferior to apixaban for stroke. Mm -hmm. And those data that we presented today and are published in the New England Journal today mm -hmm. showed that the cumulative incidence of asyndexin at 160 days mean was 1.3% of those patients had a stroke versus 0.4% of the Pixaban patients. That's an important finding in that it was statistically significant, showed harm, we stopped. It was about a little over 100 strokes, 98 to 20 some, but, but real actual you know, difference there. And the mm -hmm. curves separate early and stayed separated. Obviously, we were disappointed and wanted to understand this finding more. And mm -hmm. so we did two analyses that we think help understand this finding. The first is we looked at the PKPD, and that's, as we all learn in medical school, important to understand the drug activity. And what we showed today is that the level of, of inhibition 
w was similar between the two, between Oceanic and Pacific. So the drug worked as it had in phase two. And then we have very limited number of patients. We have about 10 patients that had a stroke and then 200 and some that didn't, that had their four, the four month or the four week, 30 day draw of the blood. Mm -hmm. And there the levels look similar too. And then finally, we looked at all the subgroups to say, was there a subgroup that seemed to do better or worse? And there's really an important message from this trial, and I think this is potentially our take home, was that, yes, it's inferior. The subgroup that seems to do better with these anticoagulants was the naive subgroup, somebody who hadn't been on an anticoagulant when they came into the trial, at least hadn't been on an anticoagulant for the prior six weeks. They got randomized to Pixaban or Asindexine. The hazard ratio for those two curves was about 1.42, still inferior, Asindexine still inferior but it shows it's doing something and it's closer to Pixaban. What do you think that is from? You know, it's interesting. This isn't the first time we've seen it. So I just want people to realize that when we looked at that subgroup, we had pre-specified, it's exploratory, it's after the trial. We pre-specified, we thought this group was higher risk. In fact, it was one of our enrichment criteria for inclusion that you hadn't been on an anticoagulant. And the reason is, even in the DOAC trials, if you're long standing on an anticoagulant, you haven't bled or had a stroke, coming into your, the trial, the chances that you have a bleeding event or stroke events much lower than somebody who's just, uh, who hasn't been treated or who's just diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. So the actual event rate of a Pixaban in this trial is fairly low. Mm -hmm. When you look at the naive patients, it comes up. So instead of being 1% per 100 patient years, it's now 1.7% or so. So a Pixaban actually probably performs, you, you're sort of finding the responders or the survivors if you don't look at the naive patients. And Asindexian performs a little bit better. Right. So in this non-inferiority trial of this indexian, 50 milligrams daily versus a Pixaban 5 milligrams twice daily, you showed that a syndexian wasn't not inferior, and in fact, it was inferior. That's right. So we, we conclude that it's inferior. Right. Now, at this dose in, against a, a atrial fibrillation, in atrial fibrillation patients with, with a Pixaban, it's inferior to a Pixaban. And there are a couple of key messages. One is, yes, it's inferior. The majority of these patients have previously been treated with an anticoagulant, and that may lead their rates to be lower, mm -hmm. but still, you may need more inhibition than 92% right. for this pathway, and you might need a different dose or more inhibition to get there. And finally, contemporary care of patients with atrial fibrillation has shown us that we're really doing much better for stroke event rates. Mm -hmm. They're coming down. That's not a bad thing, mm -hmm. but, but they're still bleeding, and they still unfortunately have mortality. So if you can find a net benefit for some of these agents, if you study it in the right population with the right dose, we think there's still path. So there's a body of work around this drug. What does a sponsor do after trial results like yours? Well, I think all of us, sponsor, uh, scientists, patients, the community, we all want our patients to do better. And it is, uh, unfortunately, this is how science is, mm -hmm. our best way forward. I reminded the audience today, it took us 50 years to be better in warfarin. Mm -hmm. We've been living in the last 10 to 15 with DOAX. This is not the end. I said it was the, the beginning of the beginning. We're learning more. Now, what the sponsors will do, I don't yet know. I know they're thinking through this. There are other Factor 11 studies going I on yeah. that are going on with IDMC. And I remain encouraged because many of them are against placebo and different indications. And those that are in atrial fibrillation, I think, with different agents or this population information we've shared, and IDMC oversight should continue and will inform us. Nicely highlights the reason we have large Trials. clinical outcome driven trials. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on your presentation. Thanks for having me.